Well, we're sending that out to the other teams on the wrong side of the score this week in CIS football. Probably strumming through the minds of many on the York team, losing 52-1 to to Queen. Guelph didn't embarrass Laurier as much as some of the other games, 21-7. Western went into Toronto and um, 50-14. to <laughs> Windsor I got Holy moly, baby, that was a tough one. If you're um, Waterloo, seventy-eight to eleven. McMaster, another route, fifty-one to twenty-four. Now we've got Donovan, Donovan Bennett uh, on the show tonight. He's from Sportsnet three hundred and sixty. He's going to call us. Uh, I said call about ten o two, so uh, he probably is a little late. Now, hopefully he knows how to use uh, the telephone. I think he should. He's a reporter. He should be pretty good at that. And, of course, McMaster beat Ottawa 51-24. to Now, I don't know if the rest of the teams had the same kind of luck that the Toronto UFT Blues had in their game. The only thing the UFT Blues won in their game against uh, Western, again, they lost 50-14, to was the coin toss. After that, it was downhill. Which reminds one of a Leaf joke, and and the Leaf joke goes like this: The Leafs look really good until they hit the ice. They're like they're like, um, um, what was that ship that got sunk? What was that ship that got sunk? The DiCaprio movie? What? Yeah, they look as good as the Titanic until they hit the ice. So there was some really bad football in the CIS, which brings to me the question: You know, these are, these games are going to be broadcast on television. Maybe there should be the Division One, Division Two type thing going on in uh, Canadian college football. It can't be pretty to sit there and uh, and you know watch that kind of stuff. Now I say this before people start thinking that I'm running the CIS. I'm not running the CIS. By that I mean I'm not running in, running them down. Um, obviously I'm not running them because there'd be Division One, Division Two schools. This is tough. It's it's tough to convince people to go out and watch the game with that kind of obvious, um, well, you know, separation in talent between two teams. It's going to, our guest tonight is going to be promoting, um, here he is right here right now, let's let's bring him in. He's going to be promoting the fact that uh, the CIS is a great league, great history. The Vanier Cup this year for the first time is going to be played on its own. No crutch with the CFL, CFL's Grey Cup. They'll be alone in Laval. And here he is, our guest, Donovan Bennett of uh, Sportsnet 360. Welcome, sir. Thank you for having me. I hope that, you know, this is a bad week for you and I to talk about the CIS. It's, it was a tough week, was it not? Yeah, it, it was. And, I mean, it's a bit of a... An anomaly because only only one conference was really in play as far as uh, regular season games go, and uh, you know slated early you had um, you know some of the the bigger heavyweights in the conference matched up with uh, some of the teams who've made vast improvements but are still not there. And I think what you saw more than anything was how big uh, a training camp is for those teams who are younger, those programs who are younger and they're really building. Remember in the OUA because they have an 11th team with Carlton coming in, they're playing a week earlier, so that's less time for progression for those young players and those young programs. And also, training camp went from 14 days to 10 days. So you saw the veteran teams with a lot of 50-year seniors like Queens, like McMaster, like Western, really having their way with the programs who are trying to close the gap, but they're doing that with younger players hoping that they develop and that they bear that fruit in the years to come. So uh, it, the, the scores were a bit lopsided, but um, I think that was a bit of an anomaly given the circumstances, not the level of play. Uh, so, so what we're talking about then is, in fairness, is that the margin of difference was accentuated by the fact that the teams that were trying are trying to get things going didn't have enough time to get it together. And of course, with football, once you dominate, you know, if you can't if you can't come up with a, a countermeasure, you see what we saw this week. Right, there's no question. And, I mean, 
it, this was a year where people said that the uh, the discrepancy between the top and the bottom it was supposed to be closing. So then, as you alluded to before I came on, when you see those scores, it's a little bit disparaging, and you thought we would have some parity. But as the the some of the weaker sisters in CIS for the last you know decade or so, the Albertas, the the Mount A's, the uh, Waterloo's, and the Toronto's, as they're taking things more seriously. They've got more resources. They've got more full-time coaches. They've got bigger support from not just the athletic departments, but also from the university presidents. It's not like the, the teams at the top are, are also just staying afoot at the same place. We're seeing even more resources uh, being put into the Laval program, which we didn't think was possible. We're seeing Guelph, who was probably in the middle of the pack, really accelerate things uh, under the leadership of Stu Lang. Uh, you know, Western is looking to bring more full-time coaches on in the years to come, and they're fundraising to do just that. Uh, Blake Nill is in, is bringing in more money with uh, the Calgary alumni year in and year out. So it's not like the, the strong powers uh, at the top of each uh, independent conference are just sitting back and waiting for uh, some of the weaker sisters to close the gap. They're actively working hard, and I think it comes from uh, the top. Laval is the standard and when it comes to CIS football, and, and really CIS athletics, and they've made it very clear that if you aren't willing to compete, not just football-wise, but fiscally, we're going to leave you uh, in our wake. And the athletic departments across the country have a hard decision. Do we want to just be doing this for the sake of doing it, or do we want to do it at a high level? And with that comes cost, and with that comes effort. Uh, so some of the stronger programs are ramping up even more to try and stay, you know, within arm's reach of Laval. Yeah, and, and, and it will be difficult. Uh, you know, um, we, we said we would discuss before the program the, uh, scanning the, the conferences and how they work out. The top ten um, with only, as you, as you mentioned and as you alluded to, uh, only one uh, conference or, or whatever, OUA in play, Laval is number one, Queens number two, Calgary number three, Western number four, Montreal five, Master six, Guelph 7, Sherbrooke 8, Saskatchewan 9, Manitoba 10. Do you see any surprises there and uh, in the top 10 where they rank at this point early, Donovan? Um, no, not not really uh, any surprises. I think some people were, um, you know, a bit up in arms that there were four OUA teams, you know, in the top ten. I think, you know, often people think that the, the media coverage, because a lot of it comes out of Ontario, that's where the national networks are and the national newspapers are, they feel that there's a slant to Ontario. But when you really break the numbers down, four teams out of which is now 11 with Carlton joining is not really that much, not an over-representation when you think, you look at the Q, which is just next door to Ontario, they've got three teams, and that's a 16 conference. Um, so I, I wasn't really uh, surprised at how many teams Ontario got. I was a bit surprised that as down as the AUS has been, that uh, they weren't uh, you know, re represented uh, more so uh, by Acadia. I think uh, Coach Cummins does a great job out there. I, I think they're going to be a strong program again. But it's just so hard to evaluate Acadia because their level of competition is, is really not that strong. So the only time you really get to evaluate them is when they cross over and they play the Quebec schools, which obviously hasn't happened just yet because just off of uh, their interconference games alone, it's, it's damned if you do, damned if you don't. If they win in a blowout, well, that's what they were supposed to do. Uh, look how bad the rest of the AUS is. If they uh, win in a close game, then, oh, well, Acadia is clearly down. So uh, I, I, if I was to be surprised by anything, it was that, um, you know, Coach Cummins, given how strong his teams have been, you know, over the past couple of years, it didn't get, uh, you know, some higher recognition. Yeah, they, you know, uh, the thing about, you know, I, I didn't mean to sound like, I, I realize now it might have sounded like it's being harsh against uh, the CIS, but I think it is important. And Donovan, you have to admit that with the, you know, with, with the levels of play by the team in the CIS, would it be that hard to, to division these guys out so that these teams out so that, you know, the teams that are trying to enter in and, and be a part of, this great league, which the CIS is, this national pride, 
a way of working themselves in instead of you know you know basically throwing them to the wolves. That I, I hope you understand my my uh, my position. It isn't. Yeah, uh, no, I'm I, not. Uh, I'm not making fun of the league. I, I'm seriously saying that there has to be a kind of blending taking place. You know, it's the great thing about the U.S. colleges is that you know if you're a Division two team and you play another Division two team, you know you, you know what you, you know what you're up against. But it's kind of hard when you have teams with that much money you mentioned, uh, that much talent you mentioned, and and that much preparation you mentioned again. Uh, for for other organizations like UFT is trying to make a comeback, for example, and you really don't want to kill that comeback desire because it's you know because the team is getting creamed. You know what I mean? That that's where I'm coming from. I just want to make that clear. Yeah, no, it, it's a it's a valid point. It's a good point. It's a point that people have made because uh, when you look at the uh, the university intercollegiate. Uh, experience for a student athlete, and, and uh, you know w- when I was playing, UFT was was down worse than they are now. And you had at at, at that point um, kids who had come through the program, who have graduated, um, done their time, and they hadn't won a game. Uh, so think about that going through your career and not and virtually not winning a game, not having any sort of success, albeit making the playoffs or any type of team goal that you'd you'd start out with. That's not the experience that we want for our student athletes. We obviously want things to be competitive, um, but, but you know, who no one's really gaining from that sort of experience. So it may be a tiered system where they're playing uh, you know, Opponents who are closer to their level um, would foster a better uh, experience for that student athlete. But here is the big issue with that that I don't think anyone has really been able to to wrap their head around and, and find a, a cure for. Um, once you're in that Division II, um, you know, let's say it's like the Premiership where you're relegated and you can move up and move down. I don't. I just don't see, foresee a way that you're going to move out of that state to to be ever become again an elite Division One, so to speak, or elite team in the CS because the life bread of any football organization is recruiting. It's getting blue chip athletes into your program, and then it's up to you to develop them. Well, I don't, you're not going to get a blue chip athlete to come to your program when you're Division Two. In Canada, we're fighting hard enough to keep our great football players in Canada from going to the NCAA. And in some cases, the NCAA is the proper choice and, the, and a great choice. But when you look at maybe going to a Division Two, II, Division One AA, or Division Three school, the experience now that we have scholarships across the board is probably better in Canada. And the education uh, most certainly is better in Canada. I don't see a, a, a young man leaving his house and saying, I'm going to play uh, you know, a Division II for whoever it is, Waterloo or York or Mount A or Alberta or UBC, and not going and playing in one of the Tier 1 schools. So I think what ends up happening is you're exaggerating that problem even more so, where all the top recruits – go to the elite schools, and, and all the, the leftover recruits go to the uh, schools in Tier 2. Uh, I think now you have the chance to say to a kid, hey, listen, we're not very good right now, but you're going to come here, you're going to play right away, and if you come here, you can be part of the change that makes this program elite. You can go somewhere and be just another one of their great players in their history, or you can come here and be someone who's really fostered change at this institution. And I think we're seeing some kids buy into that. Uh, Obviously not enough for those teams to make a transition, but you you look at Guelph, look at the things they've done with their uniforms and their facilities and uh, their code of conduct and the way they handle themselves. They went from a team that, you know, was – Three, had three wins and was out of the playoffs, and now they're, they were in the Yates Cup a year ago, and they had a great rooting class again this year. You look at schools like Laval and Sherbrooke, who didn't have football programs, didn't have football alumni, but quickly turned their programs around to become elite because they recruited hard and because they put resources into their football programs, and they armed their coaches with the ability and the autonomy to – put together a good infrastructure and a good staff. We'll see what happens at Carleton, but they've got a great coaching staff. They've got lots of resources, so they're on the right track so far. So it can be done. It's just whether or not people are willing to literally roll up their sleeves and work hard, but also roll up their sleeves and fundraise, either through the traditional way of getting money from alumni 
or having the university say, this is something that's important to us, it's a priority, we're going to back it and fund it 100%. So uh, I think that there's there's two sides to that issue. It's a complex topic. It's one that's being discussed. And even from the top, some of the elite teams, uh, you know, I've talked to Coach Constantine at Laval about this, about, you know, the pro- the prospects of having an elite division where you have the top six schools, Calgary and Western and Laval and Mac and whoever else is up at that time, and they fly across the country and play each other. Would that not be better for those guys to really be pushing themselves so now you're getting better, more competitive games. You're getting better TV numbers because the games are closer. Those athletes are playing against better competition, so thus they have a better fighting chance when they try and make the CFL or even the NFL. And, and, and there's some merit to that as well, but it's not a foolproof uh, system. I think we really need to have these discussions and vet the process to find out what works for the kids at the top and what works for kids at the bottom. Uh, it doesn't have to, in my opinion, I think I agree with you. Um, uh, for the most part, I agree with you with what you're saying. Uh, I'm, re- I-, I think, though, that they still have to figure out a way uh, to soften um, entrance into the elite for for teams, even if it's even if it's the way they schedule. And, and what I'm referring to, there's not enough teams to really have a uh, a U.S. version or, or a, as you mentioned, the, uh, the football soccer version of uh, Division One, Division Two. I'm referring more or less to uh, where you almost have two seasons uh, in one season, uh, where you start off with you, you have the you know you, you separate you, you have basically you have the the teams at the beginning of the season it becomes more like a progression where you have the teams at the beginning of the season play each other with teams that are of the same caliber and see which teams almost like a playoff almost when you come out of the gate to give a motivation to those lower teams. As you said, and, and, and I believe in what you said, when I was covering, uh, when I was doing play-by-play of OUAA football uh, years ago, um, you know, I did it for about 20 years, and the biggest thing that the biggest thing that was impacting me uh, was the fact that you had teams that that were not motivated um, by virtue of their inability to win. Um, now, that doesn't mean that I'm saying that was an obvious lack of motivation. But there is a desire to win, and there is a desire to compete. And what I'm looking for as a fan of the CIS, uh, a longtime fan, uh, is competition and somehow how to enhance that. And the simplest way to say is Division One, Division Two. When really that's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is starting the season on a more competitive level, and then seeing what teams are making that progress, and then have them start to play schedule the first half of the season in a way that helps promote victories, as you said, for the teams that are of lesser uh, history, if you will, and then and then have them sort of play the tougher teams. And the teams on top who maybe uh, shouldn't be there, uh, you, you don't necessarily drop them, but you, you, ha- you have them play against other teams. Uh, essentially, in, in the CIS, um, really... There's a lot of there's a lot of um, well I don't think really wins and losses are as important as some may think. Uh, there are reputations that put as you said and as we look at the top ten, it, it's more about people like you who understand the game and who help judge which teams are better and the top ten. Um, they establish themselves without I don't I don't want to say without playing, but the games are important, but they're not the whole reason why a team is ranked high. Uh, you know, professionals, the people who understand the game, the people who love the CIS, who are involved in it, can help, uh, you know, arrange to have schedules made that are more productive uh, for players and, and teams to be progressive and progress like they should. Um, in my in my opinion, when it comes to educational, um, you know, uh, places like, uh, you know, university and college that offer sports, because essentially that's what these people are doing. They're, they're, they're you know, they're students. And, uh, yes, they, they do hope to, in the future, play CFL, uh, but the majority of them aren't. The majority of them are, are living in experience. Uh, I got a daughter going to college. Uh, the education part's really important, but it's also what happens after school that's important. And, and I think enhancing that experience, like you said, is a great way to, uh, you know, give people good memories. Yeah, well, I mean, I couldn't agree more. I'm a, you know, a living testament of that. Everything that's good in my life has come from the game of football, including my present occupation. And, you know, no doubt I, I can only tribute that to having played, you know, at the uh, intercollegiate level 
in Canada. Um, and as far as it, letting the, the schedule kind of dictate um, who plays who and when based on, you know, strength, uh, it, there's some – Merit to that, and I know that um, you know Brian Crawford at the OUA, you know, who does the schedule, uh, looks very hard into kind of making sure that the schedule makes sense for everybody, and and, and maybe as, as you proposed, having some of the the, the um, weaker teams play each other early, and then you know playing the the stronger teams later in the season, kind of building up as they get stronger. Uh, yeah. The people on the flip side to that would say. Um, you know, football is a war of attrition. And, you know, some of the, the younger teams that kind of don't have the depth in numbers but also in strength, you know, their injuries kind of pick them off later in the year. And as a strong team, I'd rather face, uh, you know, look at Carlton, for example, who's going to dress probably 70 guys this year because it's their first year back. Well, you know, when you've got five, ten injuries, now you're looking at, you know, practicing with 60, 55 guys, and when you're looking at giving reps to everyone and having a, a scout team, it, it it hurts how you practice, how you, who, how you uh, perform. Uh, so it, there are some coaches from the stronger teams who will tell you, I'd rather play a weaker team late in the season than early in the season. Early in the season, they're, they're fresh, they're, everyone's relatively healthy. Late in the season, you know, that war of attrition actually hurts the, the weaker teams more so than the stronger established teams who have more depth. And if I play a weaker team late in the schedule, it's virtually uh, a, you know, a, a bye week without having a bye. You know, I can look at the plus minus as far as where I'm going to be in the standings. I can score as many points as I need to comfortably, and then I can get my starters out of there, keep them rested, and uh, look at kind of my depth players and give them a chance to uh, to earn a roster spot and make the bus, so to speak, as we move into the playoffs. So, again, it, there, there's definitely two, uh, two minds of thought uh, on that issue, and I think the next – you know, two to three years is going to be really telling in the CS because, again, you have more um, ADs who are aggressive and more presidents who say we want the positive feedback and fanfare from having a, a proficient football team. And you have some strong powerhouses with a long history of success who are not just going to, you know, stop working hard. And, you know, last year, back-to-back -back years, we had four teams represent their conferences in the bowls, Acadia, McMaster, uh, Laval, and Calgary. As I look at the landscape this year, Katie is the favorite out east uh, by far. Laval is always the favorite out of Quebec. Calgary by far the favorite out of the Can West. And McMaster is definitely in the conversation to come out of the OUA with uh, Queens, with Guelph, and with Western. You can virtually pick a name out of the hat of those four, and that's who's going to be representing uh, Ontario in the Bulls. So for the most part, for the last three years, we're going to have the same teams representing their conferences. And we may have that for the foreseeable future. Uh, so it will be really interesting to see two, three, four years in if the results on the field remain relatively the same as far as who has a lock hold on football in the respective conferences whether or not there are some institutions who just throw up their hands and say, you know what, we, we've got no chance at this point, or who some become even more aggressive in trying to close that gap with the, the, the strong powers around the country. You know, in, in sports, uh, and, and we're going to move on to the players, but I guess the, you, I want to add to what you just said. And the motivation for teams, the, the big motivator is going to be uh, if a team uh, sneaks in there that, that wasn't in there will help motivate the other teams that are in the same position as that team. Just a little bit of a, a surprise team in there will help give uh, confidence and motivation maybe to the other team. As you know, in all sports, when a team that doesn't – like how many times did we see uh, in Major League Baseball, the, the Minnesota Twins, uh, they won a World Series. Uh, the Kansas City Royals won a World Series. Um, in past years, Oakland has played well. And these are all teams that aren't high-profile teams. And it does give the other teams hope, other than the Yankees, the Red Sox, et cetera. So, you know, that, that's what I hope for. I hope uh, some of this progress that uh, you seem to have uh, hinted at does take place. Now, no progress on a team is going to happen unless you have the players. I had a good opportunity to speak to a, a real good prospect uh, at quarterback, something that's really difficult. I'll start by mentioning William Finch at Western. This kid came out of high school last year, trained with Hamilton, the Tiger Cats. This year, I met him at the at the Argo training camp. Uh, he trained with them. 
uh, this year, his first year at Western, his first year uh, as not a, a rookie, if you will. Uh, at the end of last year, he had an opportunity to show what he could do, and he showed some really good stuff. Really great quarterback. Today he ran for, uh, not today, but this week he ran for a TD. Um, you know, great quarterback. Uh, first, William Finch, and uh, any other players that we should be looking at this year? Well, I mean, you hit the nail on the head with Will Finch. Uh, he's, he's kind of the prodigy as far as Canadian quarterbacks go. Uh, he's the next in the line of great ones coming out of the OUA, and I was actually up in London uh, doing a feature on him and talking to him. I'm so impressed with uh, n not just his ability, but his aptitude. We watched film, and you know, just as a youngster, uh, you know, he's still uh, able to tell me all his reads, his sight adjustments, his, his route concepts, what he's looking for, you know, it, what shade he's looking for, what he's calling at the line, what he's thinking when he goes through his progression. Uh, and he's doing this, you know, fluently as if he, he, it's just a second language to him. Uh, never mind, you know, when I was playing, he would be a true freshman because, you know, there was OAC back then. Now this is a guy uh, on, on the big stage running a very complicated offense, which is Greg Marshall's offense, uh, and they've put even more uh, concepts in it now that he's at the helmet at quarterback. And uh, his his aptitude, but also his, his poise when playing uh, is just remarkable. Uh, I remember talking to Mike Folds, who's a good friend of mine. I played with him for a long time, and he's now the head coach at Laurier, and obviously he was a good quarterback himself, the all-time leading passer in CIS history, about Will Finch. When Will Finch was in high school and he was being recruited by everyone uh, in the country and many people uh, south of the border. And Mike Folds said something to me that I, I never forget. He said, he can be better than I am. And, and that didn't strike me because it's preposterous that someone could come along and be better than Mike Fultz. That's what sports is. You know, you set the standard and someone comes along and does something great. And we saw Kyle Quinlan, you know, raise that bar after Sinopoli and Folds and so on and so forth. What struck me was that Mike Folds is a very confident guy. And for him to say that, to vocalize that about a high school athlete, to me said that this guy is special. And he led Team Canada uh, when there were two CIS current players, uh, Jesse Mills and Drew Burkle, on the roster. He was the guy in big moments who was leading the Team Canada junior team, and he was 17 years of age at that time. So that tells you how good he's been for such a long time. And when I see this guy uh, making some throws that uh, – I don't think it's hyperbole to say they're NFL-level throws, not CFL, NFL-level throws. The tight windows he's able to put balls into is just remarkable. Now, at the same time, there's a lot of throws that when he puts on the film, he's the first to say, oh, I want that one back, I want that one back. When guys are wide open, you couldn't draw it up for them to be any more open, and he misses them. And, and it's obviously not about the ability, because he has the ability. It's just about the repetition of doing it time in and time out. And that's, that consistency is what takes you from a very good player to a great player. And I think there's no question he's going to be a great player, but you learn by doing and, and getting those reps. You know, we'll just see how long it takes him to get to that point. But the ability is off the charts. The, the poise in the pocket is off the ch charts. And, and just watching him play his mannerisms, he's a mixture of kind of Mike Folds' big and ability to run and the way he drops back. But his poise and never getting flustered is very much like Ben Shaft and two quarterbacks that Greg Marshall had and did very well with, and I expect nothing less uh, from Will Finch. So, I mean, he's the guy in Ontario, I say, um, is a guy to really to, to watch. There's so many great players uh, you know, in that conference. Uh, Billy McPhee is, is another uh, prime quarterback who people are wondering, can he make the next step and play professionally? His arm is certainly uh, strong enough. Um, you know, his, his running mate, Giovanni Aprile, you know, had more – offensive yards to his name than a couple of CIS teams had total this weekend. He's such an explosive athlete. It looks like men against boys when he's playing. So he's obviously a guy, the guy in the backfield with Will Finch, uh, Garrett Sanvito, such a smooth, talented athlete. And, uh, you know, I, I expect him to rush for over a thousand yards again. Um, and that's just in Ontario. When you look uh, it, it, out into Quebec, you know, uh, Jeremy, the quarterback at Sherbrooke, his fundamentals are so flawless, and you know he's the guy out of Quebec that everyone has been watching since he was a high schooler and wondering, you know, what type type of numbers he can put up at the CIS level. And he played 
all the way through as a freshman, Will Finch came in kind of towards the end of the year as Donnie Marshall got hurt. Um, so he's a special quarterback as well. And, uh, you know, Sene, the running back at Montreal, it's just a load, just a, a bruiser, uh, constantly carrying two or three would-be tacklers and falling forward for extra yardage. He's now back, uh, and he's healthy. He was banged up towards the end of last year, so I expect him to have a big year uh, next year. Um, out East, Acadia, you know, has so many talented, uh, explosive athletes. It's almost like, uh, you know, Coach Cummins, who's an Oregon grad, is trying to bring, you know, Oregon no- north and having so many fast guys all over the field. Renault, the receiver, you know, and also a-, a good guy on special teams. He's the guy to watch out there. And it will be interesting, actually, to see the quarterback battle at St. Mary's uh, between Jack Creighton, between Ben Rossong. And Rossong, a local product who tried his trade in Western, and obviously was behind Donnie Marshall, and then you know Will Finch was coming to town, so he transferred, and he's a real, real good, uh, you know, prospect and had a great uh, highlight tape came out, coming out of high school. He's looking to really supplant himself, but a former starter on that team, Jack Creighton, a guy who started in the Vanier Cup, uh, he's coming back after he had a very scary injury last year and actually broke his neck, and that would drive a lot of people from football. He says he's got some more football in him, and he's got a clean bill of, bill of health, so he's going to try uh, it once again. So the quarterback battle uh, at St. Mary's will be very interesting because they've got so many explosive athletes that uh, all they need to do is get them the ball, and Perry Marchese, their head coach, and, uh, and who runs their offense, is some expansive ways to get his athletes in space. So they're a team to watch if they can get some consistent uh, quarterback play. And then out west, you know, Calgary, they lose a lot of good players, but one guy who didn't really feature for them last year who uh, I'm really excited to watch is Mercer Timmons. When you lose a guy like Steven Lombala who's now playing in the CFL and he's probably you know one of the best backs in the history of your program, which says a lot, uh, it's next up for Calgary. And Mercer Timmons was a big recruit, could have stayed home in Ontario, and lots of people thought he was going to go to Mac. He went to Calgary, and uh, in some spot duty, he was really exciting to watch. So I, I'm interested to see how he handles the role of being the every down back and how he manages to go through a season. But, you know, Calgary just continues to put backs in the CFL, and then it's next man up, and the next guy does a job for them. And then with Regina, their quarterback battle is you've got Shutter, the transfer, Regina born and bred, but actually his family moved to Hawaii and was playing at Hawaii. And if you know Hawaii football and the NCAA, they love to sling the rock. He's very good. And then huge recruit Noah Picton, you know, if I could describe him stylistically as like a player, it would kind of be like Johnny Manziel, a smaller guy with a big arm but likes to run around and make plays. Uh, you know, he was uh, 12 for 12 in their uh, preseason scrimmage, and he was actually working out with the team uh, last year as he graduated early and started to get a head start. So uh, who ends up being the leader of that football team as far as the quarterback and touching the ball every single play will be interesting. But whoever it is, I expect to have a big year given how well they throw the ball at Regina. Um, so, yeah, there's a lot of, of really good – you know, offensive guys all over the country. And obviously you can tell I'm an offensive guy because everyone I mentioned was on the offensive side of the ball. Well, I wasn't offended by anything you said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, okay. So so you, we started by talking about Will Finch and, and the one thing I'd like to I'd like to mention and, and my hope is as a fan and and, and I think there's a reality to this. Uh, we in Canada have provided some excellent, excellent talent in North American big league sports. You have Joey Votto in, in baseball. And, and we can go on with in baseball how many great Canadian MVPs there have been in baseball. Uh, basketball now, we are, we are starting to be a big part of uh, the NBA uh, this year, the number one draft pick from Brampton. And they're talking uh, Wiggins next year, top draft pick. Um, you know, uh, we're talking, of course, hockey. I mean, what can you say about hockey, right? Um, now, the only sport that we haven't had some real, you know, some traction when it comes to great uh, players is football in the U.S. And and when you were talking about Finch, uh, it, it appears to me, and, and when I talked to his father, it wouldn't surprise me if he might be the first great Canadian, ironically, and this is a part that I consider very ironic, 
wouldn't it be ironic, and I don't want to put too much pressure on this young lad, he's a good kid, but can you imagine if the first Canadian player to play at a level that is, you know, top-notch in the NFL is that quarterback? Wouldn't that be ironic? Yeah, I, I mean, and we've made great strides in those <laughs> those those other sports. Um, and a lot of, you know, the guys you mentioned, whether it's Anthony Bennett or Wiggins, um, you know, they had to go – uh, and play high school in the U.S. to get that formal training. And I think that's the biggest difference as far as our Canadian uh, players. Uh, because, you know, you had Von Martin drafted early uh, in the NFL draft, and he's now on his second contract in the NFL. Uh, we've got, you know, a plethora of linemen playing uh, in the NFL, and obviously Jesse Palmer had a stint playing quarterback in the NFL. Uh, the thing with quarterback specifically is that, the American quarterbacks, they get so many more reps. You, you've got, uh, you know, your, your, your spring ball. You've obviously got your season. You know, they've got uh, so many throwing camps and passing academies. You've got, you know, seven-on-seven seven ball, which is big in places like Texas and California, which is just, you know, it's virtually, you know, flag football and steroids. And, and with the concepts and the way football is going and, and people are now throwing the football to run it rather than running it to throw it, um, they're just getting so many more reps throwing the football. Uh, now, with our kids coming up, uh, you're seeing kids who are playing high school football, and they're also playing uh, rep football in the summer, where, you know, historically in Canada, it was one or the other. If your high school team was pretty good, you concentrate on high school. Uh, if your rep team was pretty strong, then that was your focus if you didn't go to a high school where football was a big deal. Now many kids are doing both, and even if they're not uh, getting a lot of reps once they get to college, sometimes they're still playing football outside of the their institution of higher learning. They're doing it on their own, you know, in the summers. So as our passers get more and more reps, and you know, I think uh, you know Damon Allen does a great job with his passing academy. As we get more passing academies up north, and, and they get more great tutelage from people who uh, have plied the trade at a high level. And, and also, you talked about it earlier, what happens when people start to see success. When they start to see success, when our great athletes say, you know what, I don't have to become a receiver to make it to the CFL or to the NFL. I don't have to become a DB or a running back. I can do it as a quarterback. And when you have the best athlete on the field and the smartest athlete on the field, Playing quarterback, that's a dangerous combination. You know, I think Will Finch, in many cases, is that guy. So whether or not it is him, whether or not he's that guy, um, we'll, we'll see. But I think the movement, as far as the amount of repetitions our guys are getting, the amount of hours, and I don't want to sound like Malcolm Gladwell, but the amount of hours that you put in that 1,000-hour rule to becoming excellent at something will Put us in a better position to, uh, you know, to knock down that door, so that you, you maybe you do see a Canadian passer on Monday Night Football in the years to come. Yeah, and and, and it doesn't necessarily just have to be. I was just the irony of it being a quarterback because quarterbacks can't seem to cut it. Canadian ones anyway in the CFL. Um, you know, we have we have changed uh, for those that watch football closely enough. A lot of the talented positions are being played by by Canadians. For those of us that sit here in Toronto. Andre Dury is doing a great job as a Canadian in a position that maybe a couple of years ago a Canadian might not have been, uh, you know, slotted for. Uh, we've got running backs now that are, are, are running in the CFL and, and running John Cornish, MVP. What else do you want to hear? Uh, so, you know, Canadian football is well on the way uh, to doing some great things. And uh, you guys are going to do great things for the CIS at Sportsnet. You're going to be broadcasting, I guess, uh, what is it, a uh, 11 games or, or something like that, or 21 games. I'm sorry, I, I don't remember exactly how many. But Sportsnet uh, 360 will be broadcasting CIS football. Tell us about it, and tell us about your contribution to CIS uh, football on the airwaves. Yeah, it's it's uh, exciting. Uh, so you know, Sportsnet obviously taking over, uh, you know, the scores coverage, and they really kind of expanded it. And uh, it, you know, it, it should be a great home and a great platform for not just football, but for all CIS sports. But obviously, football is that driver. So we're doing the the OUA season uh, starting in week three with the matchup of two ranked teams, uh, Western at McMaster. As Greg Marshall takes the Mustangs back to a place he knows well, obviously, in McMaster and McMaster 
Leicester ended Western season a year ago. So that one should be a, a very, very good contest. And we go right through the OUA regular season until the Yates Cup. And then we find out who's going to be hoisting uh, North America's oldest football trophy. Uh, so we've got the Yates Cup coverage. And as the season kind of winds down, you know, you may see some some more coverage with us as far as right on campus having a pregame show and things like that. So so that will also be nice. And then we're going to take the coverage a little bit further this year, all the way into the bowl games, doing both uh, the national semifinal bowl games and then uh, obviously with the Vanier Cup out in Laval. And nobody puts on a better party uh, as far as the Vanier Cup for than Laval, and often it's because, you know, at the end of the party, they're the ones hosting it. Uh, but but we want to be the host for CIS Sports in this country. Uh, it's not just going to be the broadcast. You know, we're, there's going to be an online presence as well. If you go to sportsnet.ca, uh, there is a CIS section where you're going to see highlights. You're going to see uh, reviews from each team, previews of the matchups coming up. Uh, I'm going to put up my top ten vote there every week and give you a little synopsis of how I came to that vote. So so I'm just opening myself up for more criticism, uh, which is fine. I'm also going to be contributing, you know, a couple of my thoughts, a couple of uh, articles and blog posts and uh, a breakdown of, of the matchup that we have on the air uh, that week. So you can uh, go to sportsnet.ca uh, slash CIS for all of our CIS coverage um, starting in the football season and then moving on. And then the other thing you're going to see is some of the features that I'm doing, and that's kind of my part of the coverage this year, uh, some of the interviews with the athletes and with the coaches, uh, they're not just going to play during the broadcast at halftime like they did in previous years. They're also going to be put up on the website on sportsnet.ca, and you're going to see them uh, on our Connected show on the Friday leading into uh, the game. So if you're, when you're watching Connected, whether it's on Sportsnet Ontario, Sportsnet Pacific, wherever you are, you're going to see uh, that feature. So that's going to be a great uh, platform to shine a light on some of these great athletes to some unique viewers who wouldn't have seen them before. Uh, so that's what you can expect from the coverage. The voice of the CIS, Tim McAuliffe, will be back doing the play-by-play in the booth. So I know a lot of CIS diehard fans are excited about that. I know Tim's energized and excited about uh, being part of the coverage again because it's one of his passions. Um, and we really look to expand on what we're doing this year uh, in the years to come. Uh, you know, by the end of our deal, I think it's around 26 uh, events that we're, we're covering. So you're looking at, uh, you know, obviously men's and women's basketball, uh, men's and women's hockey, uh, and then branching out uh, in the years to come once we get our feet wet and covering some of the periphery CIS sports as well. But you're going to get a bunch of championships uh, definitely on our air and the football season uh, right through. You're going to get coverages uh, from us and, and games on Sportsnet 360. So it's an exciting time at, at our place. Donovan Bennett of Sportsnet 360. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. And uh, anytime I, I'm I'm game, and I love to talk about uh, CIS football. These, these athletes are talented. Uh, they're dedicated, and they need more exposure. So thank you for doing uh, what you're doing. And I'm looking forward to uh, listening throughout the year. Well, you're welcome. And uh, trust me when I say this: uh, we love the game, uh, and of course, it's a game that deserves to be loved. And uh, uh, I've always been enthralled by the fact that uh, talented people like yourself move on to television, and you make that seamless move quite well. Congratulations. I've got an interview with uh, the kid that we talked about, William Finch. Why don't we go to that interview right now? I had a chance to, uh, I had a chance to talk to your dad. Oh, yeah. Right? You're a local boy. I just, I'm just down the road, too. So. Oh, yeah. Burlington's very no, – no, it has a lot of notoriety when it comes to minor football. And that's where you came from. Tell us a little, a little bit about the, the minor football experience for you. Um, it's been pretty good. I've played uh, in the BMFA in the, the St. Peter program for, uh, I'd say, 10, 11 years, maybe even more. And uh, the coach is always good. They always develop their players. I know uh, some people call uh, Burlington like the, I don't know what the word is, but the way they call it, but it's something the that... The hub of football. The hub of football. And, uh, and um, a lot of you guys come from there and a lot of great people too so it's it's kind of cool to be known or classified in that kind of area I guess yeah and uh, now you're here on an intern program Please uh, they bring in a CAS quarterback to uh, every one of the teams um, I think they started it last year I think um, 
it's when we come in and just learn from from the other quarterbacks there. We don't get as many reps. We kind of we more so watch rather than than perform. But uh, we get the indie period. We get we get the, the rotation on air, all that stuff. And it's, it's cool to be in the environment. You always you always pick up things you, you really didn't know, and um, it's just a fun time. It's just fun to relax. I'm sure. I'm sure. Also, William, it, it, it helps you relax when you go to or when you may come to this camp again, or, or for a different reason, more or less, to make the team. So it's it's more of a. It helps you, you know, get get the sharp edges off, you know, the nervousness and stuff. Yeah, for sure. You kind of you know what to expect. You can come in here and kind of and you know perform to your best ability, I guess, um, and not really kind of worried or nervous about what to expect. And um, I don't know. It's it's just a good experience overall. It's, it's a good thing to have. What well, uh, what attracted you to playing football to begin with? Like, what was the big thrill of playing football? Um, see, I don't know. I think I started really young, and I think it'd be the backyard. I my, my next door neighbors would always come over, and my dad would be out there, and we'd always be playing kill the carrier or, or whatever that is, and we just we just throw on the backyard and just make plays. All right, and then then you played in Burlington, and then you went to university, and you were down the road here, right? Yeah, and uh, I'm in London. In London. Yeah. And what's that like? The experience there? That's awesome. Uh, coach Marshall's a great coach, and um, I've learned lots so far, and um, still more to come. So three more years, three or four more years, and uh, you know it's just an awesome tradition school. Um, no worries. Everything is there. It's awesome. And the hope is by the time that you graduate and enter into the combine, if you will, uh, maybe quarterbacks that are Canadian will have a better chance to make the team. Because right now they don't really have the best of chances to make the team, do they? Yeah, that's. I, I don't know. I think they're maybe not against it, but I know that it's hard to make it if you're a quarterback in, in Canada. And uh, you know, that's one thing I want to. One of my goals is to is to kind of help pave the way or help um, keep that road going because uh, Quinlan's has his chance right now, and I hope uh, he can kind of open the door. And uh, yeah, just it's great. Well, well good luck. Thank you. All the best. That's a really yeah. The, uh, Kyle Quinlan retired, and here he is, uh, one year, two years, trying to make it as a professional as a CFL quarterback in Montreal. Retires and goes back uh, to coach at his school a couple of years later. And uh, of course, Finch was referring to the team in London, which is Western, and they're ranked number four in the CIS right now. And uh, you know, it's an important thing to remember. In college sports, it's not all about winning. It's about development as well. And uh, the development of teams as well as players. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of teams that, well, let's be honest. Um, we saw, we talked about the scores. Um, you know, there is a difference. There is a difference uh, in talent. And, uh, you know, it is difficult. Uh, to improve. This is Donovan Carter. Spoke to him a little while ago talking about the future in the CIS. Donovan Carter, former first round draft choice of the Toronto Argonauts, defensive coach for the University of Toronto Blues, will be more than just a football coach for the University of Windsor Lancers. At the ripe old age of 37, Carter, who spent the past four seasons at, as the defensive coordinator at the University of Toronto, is the Lancers' new full-time associate head coach and defensive coordinator. Along with his duties, Coach Carter will also be required to teach, come up with fundraising initiatives for the football program, as well as handle recruiting for the team. This role progresses my career, said Carter, who was the fourth overall pick in the 2000 Canadian Football League draft and spent seven seasons in the league playing linebacker and safety for the Toronto Argonauts, Ottawa, Hamilton, and Winnipeg. There's other parts and contributions I would like to make. Lancers head coach Joe DeMore said there were 30 applicants for the job, but Carter's coaching background and roots in the Toronto area set him apart. While the Varsity Blues have struggled in the win column in recent years, Carter's defense has made an impact. Two years ago, Toronto had the number one pass defense despite being 2-6, and six, Carter reminded us. Carter, who is from Brampton, also served as a defensive coordinator with the Etobicoke of the Ontario Varsity Football League. It's a tough area for us to recruit and creates a lot of challenges, DeMore said of the GTA. He's concerned for the con and connection to the players in that area is big. While not deep in knowledge, 
about the Windsor area school, he does know a, gra a graduate of that school. His brother Michael, who received a Bachelor of Commerce degree. Windsor coach Demore said that with seven CFL seasons under his belt, speaking of Carter, and four years coaching at the CIS level, again Carter, has nothing to prove to his players. Donovan not only has experience running a defense at the CS, CIS le level, but his extensive playing career in the CFL gives him instant credibility with our players, Demore said. He brings a sound defensive system that will allow our players to play fast and adapt quickly. Windsor and Carter will blend well in the city of hard work. I want my defense known for hard work, Carter said. Bring your hard hat. Be physical and aggressive to the ball. Improving on back-to-back -back playoff appearances will be Carter's leadership goal and taking another step up the OUAA football standings is his aim. There's a lot of great athletes here, Carter said. I'm going to promote competition. I want the guys to embrace that. I think that will help us. That kind of makes bad teams good teams and good teams very good teams if you have a great competition in there and make tough decisions for the coaching staff. I ran into Donovan Carter at the Argo training facility, and this is what we talked about. CIS has uh, a program where they're developing quarterbacks. Can you... Uh, give us your opinion on how that's working and what you see that doing in the future for football, for Canadian quarterbacks. I think it's a great opportunity to get kids the exposure to come out to camp and get the type of coaching they do. Um, you know, the issue is do we have enough coaches, uh, capable quarterbacks to get to, to all the CFL camps and, um, you know, take advantage of that type of opportunity. You know, but I think it's, it's great for the game. Um, you know, will it lead to a quarterback, that that would be the hope, and uh, that would be something I would look forward to seeing. It, it doesn't hurt to give the quarterbacks an opportunity to develop. The one problem that Canadian quarterbacks have is that they don't come out of um, you know the kind of the kind of training that American quarterbacks go through. In a way, what you're doing here is, I guess, uh, or the, at least the CIS is doing, is trying to introduce the quarterbacks to let them know there might be a future. They get a chance to develop. Where what we have now is we have a, a ceiling that that happens. It's no fault of anybody in particular. It just means we got to work harder, I guess, to create quarterbacks and give them the confidence that there's a job waiting for them at some point. Yeah, no question. Because you know what, they get. They get coached so well from a young age in the U.S., and there's definitely a catching up that needs to be done at that position. Um, so uh, that would be, I mean, like I said, I think there's a lot of good young quarterbacks uh, with the ability of playing our game. I think that's their advantage, learning our game from a young age, the wider field, and now let's see if we can give them the tools to take advantage of that. And know what, the, and know what they need to do, right? Yeah. Let's talk about Windsor. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Canadian college football sometimes seems to be, uh, you know, four or five teams run, uh, basically overpower the rest. Mm -hmm. um, do you see in the future where there might be a little more of a balanced situation and or what do we need to create that or to, you know, create an atmosphere of a more competitive side? And I think it's well on the way. I think a lot of the teams that were traditionally at the bottom of the division, and particularly in the OUA, have definitely closed that gap. So um, it's... It has to happen with recruiting and, and the resources that each program has. And that's what, like you said, the strong has stayed strong because they've been able to keep a lot of the top recruits. But now with um, more balance, good coaching going to different schools, I think uh, some of the prospects coming out are going and making up different choices than they did in the past and not just going to this program that's at the top of the division. So, um, you know, with that and, and with Windsor, Windsor's done a good job now of getting into the playoffs for the last few years, and, you know, I've been brought over there to see if I can help them take the next step and uh, start to contend with some of the perennial powerhouses in our division and across the country. Tell me about uh, where your team's at and where you see the progress specifically on your team. A lot, a lot of good kids out there. Uh, great talent pool in the Windsor area. Um, the offense has done exceptionally well um, over the past few years. Joe going in there and solidifying that with recruiting as well. 
Um, and, and, you know, my hope is to come in there and bring that structure to the defensive side and see if we can get them competing as well as they're doing on the offense, on defense there. You know, they have the personnel. And it's, for me, to just put a system so the kids, you know, fly around and make plays on defense. How about a couple of names that we should be looking out for? A couple of names. we got a good disruptive DN. I, I'm going to be defensive bias <laughs> in a little bit. But uh, I'll, I'll say a couple of offensive guys. I like Ty Sam, a good guy up front. Um, he went to the East-West for our team and represented us well. Josh Burns, I think, is a guy who you could look to be drafted next year, a secondary, a free safety. You know, has the speed to be a guy that uh, American coaches here in the CFL will look at at that position. Um, you know, we we think that we have the best quarterback now that Quinlan's moved on with um, Kennedy at the quarterback spot. He, he's he's the leader of our team. So. Um, yeah, you know, a lot and, and a lot of explosive guys. Are, you know, at, at a lot of explosiveness on that team for sure. I'm sure Donovan will ignite that explosiveness. Yep, and uh, it's it, it really is. Uh, it may sound like I, I've got this thing about quarterbacks in, in the CFL, and uh, you know, playing in the IS. It's just that you know it is the Hollywood position and and to not have a Canadian in that and in quotations Hollywood position it's not shameful but it's a shame to to say the least uh, you know it would be nice if uh it would change and and you know what it it will change uh, we just got to figure out how to make it work um to conclude this portion of the program and the CIS and the quarterback issue with kids like Will Finch what has to happen is there has to be an opportunity for the quarterbacks um, somehow to be on the roster first and then given an opportunity to play, uh, much like a Kolaris got with, uh, with the Argos a couple of weeks back. And maybe uh, they can show uh, that they belong. We're going to take a short break, and when we come back, we're going to change our focus from the CIS the CFL. Travis Lule is a, is a player who um, whose reputation is taking a, a major hit this year. He's almost, well, 50% of touchdowns that he throws. Well, what has he got? 13 touchdowns and something like so, 16 touchdowns and seven interceptions. The touchdown to, you know, to interception ratio is a little high. Has he peaked? Is he a quarterback? that will be able to carry uh, the BC Lions to victory? That's a good question. Uh, uh, right now, he's not being very successful, but he does have fans, and those fans are justified to be fans for him. Travis. Travis Lule. He's awesome. Yeah, I love this guy. He's real. You know you're right. Love the outdoors. He's out there, all out, every game. you got to like that. Look at him. Always looking to land the big catch. He's accurate, articulate. He's a winner, champion. He's got a great cup. He's the real deal. Yeah, you gotta love this guy. CFL on TSN. You need to see these guys play. We talk about uh, BC, and uh, of course in BC they had the white ribbon. Cam- Was it the white ribbon campaign that they've introduced now here in Toronto? Uh, it's violence against women. Uh, we all know that. In the Canadian Football League, the players and the teams in the CFL work very diligently in the we, uh, in the, uh, the community to try as hard as they can to be a positive impact on the community. It's no doubt that the biggest reason is that a lot of these teams have their roots in community. The teams themselves are community teams. They're teams that are owned by, uh, you know, people in the community. Um uh, Hey, look at Saskatchewan, uh, look at Calgary, look at uh, Edmonton, uh, look at Hamilton, uh, you know, look at here in Toronto as well, uh, Winnipeg, Montreal, wherever you go in the CFL, the, the players are down to earth and, and, and they're here. They're here for you to enjoy, not only as players and entertainers, but also as members of the community. A lot of big noise being made uh, here in the the metro Toronto area with the Ricky Ray situation. Will he play or won't he play? 
I told you last week, and I'll tell you again. He will be playing. For goodness sake, he wasn't even bandaged. I think he was more hurt by the way the Argos played against Calgary emotionally than he was physically. But that right shoulder is connected to that right arm, and at 78% clip that he's uh, passing with no knock on wood interception, of course they sat him out. So, enough about Ricky Ray. He will be there. That He will be calling the play. Don't worry, Argo fan. Please. Holy crap. Unbelievable. I mean, well, I talked about Lule, and uh, so just to, you know, I, I went over on the, the CFL webpage, and, and I noticed that the writers have had their opinion on the players and how they're doing. And uh, at quarterback, these uh, affable, not laughable, these affable writers, 12 of them? No. And then we gotta, I can't even count, Frank. It's 10. Oh, so we have 10 writers. And, and this is how they felt about the quarterback position. It, it doesn't matter which guy said what, because that's not what's important. What's important is it was Durant, Ray, Durant, Ray, Ray, Durant, Durant, Ray, Ray, Ray. Well, that sounds like a song, doesn't it? Now, should we talk about last week's game? You don't want to bring up last week's game. Or should we talk about next week's game? Okay. The felines are playing this week in BC. That would be the Tiger Cats and the Lions. Uh, Tiger Cats are going to go above 500. They are going to beat the other Pussy Cats, the BC Lions. That's my opinion. Uh, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers are up against the Saskatchewan. Well, you know, Winnipeg hasn't shown very much life. And I sure hope this is the week that they do, they show some life. I'm not sure that they'll win, but they will show some life. Oh, and by the way, Frank, and uh, let's see, Edmonton, Calgary, um, and Montreal, and Toronto. Uh, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers against the Saskatchewan Rough Riders, and of course the Winnipeg Blue Bombers have not had a very good year. Um, you know, it's been one of those years, and, and unfortunately, it's been predictable. And, and that makes it worse, because down deep, I'm sure the Winnipeg Blue Bomber fans knew that something silly might have happened this year. Um, but they're in a rebuilding mode. Uh, they've, you know, replaced their CEO. Uh, the big, the big guy has been replaced with a guy that understands the game of football maybe better. And, and hopefully that will will be something really good that happens for Winnipeg uh, in the second half of the season. Now, I predicted all along that the second half of the season is going to belong to Edmonton. Edmonton is going to have the better part of their year. I thought they'd be better than 1-7. Uh, they aren't, um, but not because they haven't played well. They just haven't played well enough. That has been the problem for them. Their, their issue isn't like Winnipeg's issue. Winnipeg looks uh, a lot more um, in need of improvement. Now, this will be the week that Edmonton finally wins the football game. It will be against Calgary. Yes, the team that beat the Argos last year. Uh, sorry, this last week. And um, it will be because Edmonton finally catches a break. They have caught no breaks this year. It's been a difficult thing for them. Uh, they've had a hard time, and, and, and they deserve a break. The next game, and that is, of course, the Montreal game here in Toronto in September, uh, and that would be this new month coming in. We're at the end of August, September 3rd, 7.30 p.m. Um, I'll be there, and uh, it is going to be a barn burner. And it will be a barn burner because because Montreal has confidence now. Um, the Argos, though, they have come off a loss against those Calgary Stampeders. And uh, if they can't get up for this game, there's no hope for the Argos. So hopefully they'll be able to get up for this game as an Argo fan and, and, and be able to do something uh, good this week. They haven't lost, I think the, they lost two in a row at the beginning of the season, but haven't since. They won four in a row. So maybe they can get on another run or they'll lose their second in a row. And uh, you know what? Montreal can do it. 
if you're an Argo fan, be careful because uh, this Montreal team has turned things around. Jim Pop is an intelligent football mind. And, uh, you know, the way that defense is playing for Montreal, if the offense just makes a, a minor contribution and throws more touchdowns than interceptions, <laughs> well, no, wait, I know, it's not going to be here. Uh, the last game. Okay, I shouldn't laugh, but to win that game against BC, main reason why I'm saying that the Thai Cats are going to beat BC, I just don't think that BC is a consist, consistent enough football team right now, um, and they've been lucky to to beat uh, the Argos early in the season, and it isn't going to be something that uh, BC fans are going to like hearing. Uh, your team is um, your quarterback is not having a good year. And the Hamilton Tiger Cats, uh, who, who suffered early in the season, uh, this could be two teams going in diff- different directions. So good luck to both those teams. That really doesn't matter which team wins, uh, as long as uh, it's a good football game for the fans in BC. All right, so we were talking about Montreal and the great game that they had, and uh, that game was awesome. And Delorier caught a 57-yard desperation toss from Tanner Marsh, who I think threw three interceptions that game, wasn't it? Three interceptions. Um, and what a game. I mean, that was the best game of the week. Um, unbelievable. Now, that catch, I don't think, was the best catch of the week. The best catch of the week, I'm sorry, you know, I should I should know which guy caught it for, for Calgary. But the one that bounced off the Argo, guy, Argo player's head and then, and then was caught in the... I, in a long pass. It was another desperation throw that worked out well for the quarterback, in this case, the one in Calgary. I love those kind of plays. I don't know. Do you, do you have any recollections? You know, it's, it's that uh, Frank O'Harris uh, reception type stuff, you know, where in football the defender does everything he can, like the baseball outfielder tries to catch the ball. I remember Canseco, uh, the ball bounced off his head over the outfield fence for a home run. Those are the kinds of things that are hard to overcome, and and uh, the look on on the coaches when those catches are made are just it's just awesome. They're just so memorable, and a great opportunity to really enjoy um, you know uh, football at its at its best. The games that are played uh, this week will will be the second half of the season, and um, I don't know about about you, but the teams that that if you were to figure out which teams you think right are are on their way, um, do you think all the teams that are um, you know playing well right now are going to play well throughout the season? In other words, those that have uh, good records like Saskatchewan, Calgary, BC, Toronto, now Hamilton at four and four. And, uh, do you think these teams are going to consistently play well, and will those teams? Um, well, Montreal can't be put in the same league as uh, Winnipeg and Edmonton by virtue of the fact that they have three wins and Edmonton only has one, as Winnipeg only has one. I happen to think that Montreal's um, much better than the three and five record. They've had some tough breaks. Um, they started out with a coach they shouldn't have had. I think the Eastern Division is going to get very, very, very interesting. And for those of you that follow the program, you know as well that uh, the season for Edmonton, in my opinion, is going to begin to get very interesting as well. I see Edmonton uh, by the end of the season, what is it, uh, play 18 games or the 16? No, I forgot. Um, they're, gonna, they're going to play 500 from here on in. That's, that's what I'm saying. It won't be a great record at the end of the year, but only because of how badly they played early in the season. That's my prediction. Saskatchewan. Now, they're making some moves. They brought back. Um, they're making some moves, and and they're making those moves because they want to be perfect. And um, you know, Calgary is six and two. Are they value? Their value is it at six and two? I I guess so. You know, uh, they're they're a good team. I happen to think that, that Calgary and Toronto have a lot in common. They're, they're two teams that are very good, that if they aren't careful, they could get in trouble in the regular season. Saskatchewan is insulated by the fact that they have so much talent. Um, Toronto and Calgary, on the other hand, um, 
Just because you play well with the injuries that you had doesn't mean you're going to continue to play well. Injuries could become a factor for both those teams, and they both need to be careful. I've already spoken about BC. BC is is a team that I think um, is going to be in tough. Uh, they will definitely be the visitor um, in the, uh, the final in the West. Uh, I should say the, the semifinal in the West. Um, against Calgary or Saskatchewan, depending on how many injuries Calgary has, uh, without health, Saskatchewan, um, without a healthy Calgary, Saskatchewan will finish first. There, there's no doubt in my mind. Here we are in the middle of the season, and, and, and I happen to think that's true. Toronto depends on good health as well. Um, for them to finish first, uh, they will need to be healthy. Hamilton has always been a team that Toronto um, – has trouble with. They do have trouble with Hamilton. They did in the first game. And actually, right now, when you look at the standings, the game between Toronto and Hamilton, the standings reflect that first game of the season where Toronto barely won. So, you know, Hamilton has, uh, they're on a great roll. I think uh, Coach Austin made it clear to his quarterback, do what I tell you and we'll win. Don't do what I tell you and you won't be in. So, it's not that difficult a conversation that they had. Was I privy to that conversation? No. But trust me when I say this, something like that happened because uh, no-nonsense coaches like their quarterbacks to be no-nonsense. And Montreal is going to show us what they've got today in Toronto, or should I say in two, on Tuesday, what they've got in Toronto. Um, it's going to be fun. It's, it's going to be a, a fun, 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 fun week, guys. It's going to be a fun, fun, fun week. Now, more stories that we've been hearing about. Well, you know, they're talking on, on CFL.ca about the all-star team. Now, you heard all those things. Nobody, the, the number here to call is 714-242-5250. If you have an opinion on... Uh, on who uh, you think was missed in this wonderful little 10-reporter poll on uh, who the best players in all the different positions are. I tell you, Sheets is um, far and away. Uh, right now, he continues this. He's an MVP. He has done a marvelous job. Uh, he has done what he's been asked to do. Uh, the coaching staff at the beginning of the season said, be an all-star, be a big play player. And he has been a big play player. Um, is there any disappointment uh, in the fact that, uh, you know, the quarterback isn't getting the kind of recognition that maybe he should? Um, well, you know, from what from from what I saw and from what I see, Durant got consideration as an all-star. Um, you know, him and Ray. I, I happen to think that uh, there have been some other good quarterbacks this year. Uh, this has been the year of the backup, uh, only because of a couple of weeks where backups were called in, and together they showed a, a great a great talent. And uh, are there surprises? There's always surprises in football because there are so many players in so many positions. You know, it's it's hard if you're Chad Owen to be number one. Uh, you know, he was the MOP last year. Um, is he the MOP this year? Probably not. Is it because he's not as good? I'll, I'll, I'll say no, it's not because he isn't as good. I just happen to think that the defenses are playing him better. And that's to be expected when they name you the MOP. That's what happens. Uh, success in, in sports is followed by <laughs> you begin to wear people like a suit. And, and that's what's happened with him. So, yeah, I don't, I don't really see any surprises uh, right now in, in the all-star balloting, if you will. Uh, and then when you when you consider um, that that the teams have shown a lot of Great games. We've seen a lot of great games. There haven't really been that many blowouts this season, and that's something the CFL should be proud of. Uh, have there been Have there been teams that who haven't won enough? Well, absolutely. I mean that that's totally true. 
Um, and that's going to happen. But the teams who have lost poorly, even Winnipeg. Now, Edmonton, folks, if you followed Edmonton, if you're an Edmonton fan, you know there have been some real, real heartbreaking, gut-wrenching, last-second losses that have contributed to a 1-7 and record. So, really, has there been uh, has it been a bad year for anyone? Not, not really. Montreal's turned things around. Winnipeg is under new management. They have the insulation of having the best stadium in the Canadian Football League to at least soften the blow of the way their team is playing. They at least get to watch them in the comfort of uh, Investors Group Field, which is a an incredible... I haven't been there, but you know I've seen parts of it, and uh, I've gotten word from people who have been there. It's, it's less than disappointing, trust me, when I say that. And this is the story I like. I told you at the beginning. Uh, Barker's not ruling out that Ray will be playing. <laughs> I, just ridiculous. Come on. He's going to play. Now, the Ticats released uh, Greg Peach. Well, you know, he had six quarterback sacks, but I guess that's not enough to keep him. Now, the NFL has kicked in, so those of us that love this part of the year, when we start seeing players come in that uh, we had no idea, um, I tell you, would be here. It's going to be. It's going to be awesome. Now, some suggest uh, that the BC Lions offense is really the problem in BC. Some suggest that it's because the offense isn't as inventive as it should be. Well, you know, Lule is the quarterback. Lule is the high-profile, successful quarterback. But he hasn't been able to lift the team uh, to a level of play that the BC fans believe they should, you know, they believe they should be where Saskatchewan is. You know, uh, Harris, uh, as well, has defended his quarterback and has basically defended the way the team played. And to lose the game they did, it's funny. You know, you look at you, you look at that game between BC and Montreal where the final throw of the game leads to a victory for the Montreal Alouettes in a la- literally last-second field goal. And how that game is viewed from fans... <laughs> and how much of a different perspective there is. In BC, that was a total collapse of the team. In Montreal, it was an incredible comeback. Somewhere in between those two views is what happened. Do we know what happened? No. We don't know what happened. We don't know that Lule was a terrible quarterback that day. We don't really know that. Only because we all have a perceived notion and, of course, we have a vested interest in the outcome. What I will say as a a person who's not, um, you know, not a fan of either team, I'm not not negative towards them either, uh, what I will say is watching that game was amazing. Um, To see um, a, a quarterback throw those interceptions, and then have his team win as well. It really didn't. It didn't tell the story of what should be told in a game of football. You can't be that bad a quarterback and win the game. Or, 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 which is what BC looks at. How can you have such a great defensive effort wasted by the offense? It's unbelievable. It really is. That 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 game is the perfect example. Uh, you know, if there's a university course in 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 football and in per, uh, perceived um, views of the game by fans, that game is the perfect perfect game. That if you're to say in the dictionary, uh, perspective is everything. Who you root for is what matters. That game tells it all because both teams played really well and really badly. And it was almost like who made the last mistake, which actually is what happened. Uh, The team that made the last mistake 
is the one that lost. And that's the truth. That's all there is to it. So for you um, Montreal fans, congratulations. For you BC fans, all right, they screwed up, but they'll bounce back. This was a big week of the big plays, and um, we talked about a couple of them, and uh, they led to players of Player of the Week honors, and uh, the four players that were given uh, the nod this week, Corey Sheets, D. Webb, Tyron Carrier, Eric Delorier. Um, and, of course, uh, those four players, two of the Montreal Alouettes, um, did what they needed to do in great fashion to be voted uh, the Players of the Week. Now, I don't think uh, anyone can doubt that that Corey Sheets is going to spend a lot of time this year. He he ran for 139 yards on 24 carries, had two touchdowns in winning over Edmonton 30-27. That great a game, but Edmonton was only three points back. Keep reminding you, this team's going to turn things around. So he also had four receptions for 45 yards. And uh, also, it's the seventh time this year that uh, he has run for more than 130 yards. And uh, he's ready to beat Mike Pringle's record in 1998 when Pringle ran for 2,065 yards. That's not the first time he's won this uh, this year. It's the second time he's won. So good for him. The Hamilton Tiger Cats, D. Webb, uh, Took the defensive player honors here in week nine. Of course, uh, the Tie Cats now are 500. And the reason is he ran a touchdown back, a 38 yard interception for a touchdown, in, in their win over Winnipeg, 37 14. Now, the, we talked about Montreal, Tyron Carrier. He was the special teams player of the week. He returned a fourth-quarter kickoff, 90 yards for a touchdown, and it put Montreal in striking distance of the BC Lions. Of course, uh, Montreal won in the last second, 39-38. And uh, he is the all-time leader in kickoff return touchdowns, all-purpose yards, and reception at Houston University. So he is uh, has been a talent for a very long time. And we talked about Eric Delorier. Eric... Uh, made that amazing reception at the end of the game that led to the last second field goal. And uh, and he is another leader in Eastern Michigan, uh, all-time touchdown. And he is fifth on the Alouettes uh, with 150 receiving yards on 10 receptions this season. He is a, a native of Gatineau, Quebec, so he plays for his home province. And he's played his entire seven years with the Montreal Alouettes. So, those are the players of the week. Now, if I may, down to the last few minutes, and I, and I know, you know, it's like Toronto Sports Network, otherwise known as TSN. This program comes out of Mississauga, and uh, that's where I live, and uh, my team is the Toronto Argonauts. And I cannot, without a doubt, mention uh, the game this past week, although the Argos lost. The boat logo. Um, it's my favorite logo uh, that the Argonauts have, and it is one of my favorite in sports. I don't think there's a logo that says football better than the boat logo. Um, and, of course, uh, for those of us that live here uh, in Ontario and uh, fans of the Argonauts, the 83 Great Cup champion, Toronto Argonauts, led by Condra Holloway, Dan Ferone, Jan Carinci, these guys won a great cup after 31, 32. I keep hearing the math somehow doesn't work in my head, but Ferone says 32 years. Okay, I'll go with Ferone, 32 years. I thought it was 31, but we'll go 32 years. And it was great to catch up with these old guys. And the it, most enjoyable moment for me and most humorous is, you know, I... I, I when it comes to old athletes, I, I kind of project myself on them, and, and, and I compare my physical health and well-being uh, to them, um, you know, 30 years later. And uh, watching them 
and I use the term loosely, run onto the field at the beginning of the game. Um, you know, football players do a lot to hurt their future health by virtue of the game that they play. But one thing they can't hurt is the love and desire of the game that we witness as football fans of the Canadian Football League witness uh, on a weekly, oh heck, daily basis. There are better athletes that I've run into than the Canadian Football League players. Um, we talk all the time about their community effort and all that. But this this time, what I came back away with uh, from the experience of uh, sharing time with uh, the alumni, 83 Argonaut, is and and is something that I, I find totally heartwarming. The passion and love for each other that these guys still have 30 years later. Jan Karinci came from the west side of Africa. Um, Dan is still where he grew up in Oakville. Two pretty distant places. And they met here in Toronto once again. And it was like they never were separated. And this is true for a lot of the players. And uh, here in uh, the Mississauga area, Mississauga, Burlington, Oakville, we're very fortunate because we have many a former CFL player. Matt Damon is out here. We heard today from our guest, the Damon uh, quarterback school. Um, he's doing his best to raise the quality of players and the development of young men who desire to be football players. Um, all these wonderful athletes um, have not only gotten older, they've gotten more respected in my eyes. When I saw the way they were and how much love they had for each other, and when I watched the, the new players, in this case uh, the Argo players, uh, watching these guys and seeing how important it was to these old guys that they won a great cup together, um, the fact that the Argos won it last year and anyone else uh, watching any other player of any other team that's won a great cup, I think it brought home how important it is to be a team. I know the winning is important, but somehow I feel the camaraderie that develops on a football field, in a football dressing room, on a practice field, is as important as winning that championship. And by that I mean it's hard to win without people you like. Nothing brought that home more than uh, having that experience. And I'm grateful for that experience, and uh, it was a lot of fun. And uh, for those of you that live in the Saskatchewan area or will plan to go to the Grey Cup in Saskatchewan, consider yourselves lucky and be prepared to have a lot of wonderful memories. And when you look at the players, young and old, they will all be old down the road, and when you see them again, you will really enjoy the experience. I know I did. It was a great memory, and one that I was glad to have shared again. Um, it was a wonderful experience watching those old uh, boat logos on the helmet. Um, there was some displeasure with the way the uniforms were cut, but that's okay. That's small potatoes. The, the important thing is, is that the logo came back. Um, the players that won that great cup were given a chance to be cheered for once again. They were given another chance to celebrate together and enjoy the experience of being together. And for that, they should be grateful. At a time when, in my life, where some crazy stuff happens, and I'm sure for those of you too, we all have ups and downs. And the nicest thing about this experience is it makes the downs bearable, the ups more enjoyable, and uh, for those of you that enjoyed it as much as I did, I got a high five for you if you're paying attention. You've been listening to Candid Frank Live, streamed on Rouge Radio. Have a great week, everyone.